I think I made something helpful. Hi everybody, welcome back to Talk and Chalk. I'm Beck. if you haven't been here before, welcome. This is my platform where I share anything related to education that I think will be helpful for other teachers. Uh, I am also on other various platforms on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, which I'll link in the description box below, as well as a resource that I'm sharing with you for today. My apologies if you have been coming back to YouTube to check on any new material, which I haven't had much of lately because I've been spending a lot of my time in lockdown. <laughs> we are in our 13th, 14th week of lockdown. I currently work and live in areas that have been hotspots for COVID. And if you're in New South Wales, you know that the whole state was plunged into a lockdown recently as well, which means remote learning. So working from home with my own three children learning from home and also teaching from home as well. So that means that I've been making a lot of uh, videos for class lessons, joining in on Zooms, programming, professional learning, all of those sorts of things. But I have maintained um, a commitment to the podcast. So if you haven't seen that, it's the Teacher Takeaway podcast. We're on Spotify. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all those things. So if you haven't heard any of those episodes and you want some PL, jump over to that. Myself and three other amazing educators share content on there for you while we're still in lockdown. <laughs> so today, though, I have a resource that I'm hoping will be helpful Disclaimer, this is kind of in draft mode and I haven't had any feedback on this yet. I am hoping that you guys will be able to provide, provide feedback on it if it's helpful for you or not. I've had a lot of people, a lot of people contact me over the years for support, feedback, guidance on writing job applications and not just in the same system that I work in, in the public system, all systems. There seems to be a variety of feedback that people get on their applications, different um, preferences around what panels will like for job applications as well. But in my system, there are some very clear guidelines for some elements that some people either aren't aware of or struggle to stick to. And then there are the other components that go with it. You know, how can you represent yourself very well on paper without feeling like a schmuck as you write it? <laughs> Uh, and making sure that you're really clear in demonstrating how you meet the crit criteria that has been advertised for that specific job. So I kind of created a rubric based off of uh, my own experiences sitting on panels, my own experiences over the years applying for jobs, getting feedback, feedback on good applications, poor applications, um, and just trying to compile it in a way that maybe might help you when you are writing your job application. Now to be really, really clear, this will not guarantee you an interview or a job. This will not mean that, you know, if you use this, you will be writing the best application that goes across the line. But if you're new to writing job applications or if you're struggling to get to that interview point and you feel like the feedback that you've been getting is not really helping you get across the line, this might be helpful for you. So uh, let's flip over to my laptop and have a look at this uh, document that I've made for you. So you can see I've made, I guess, a rubric for you that should be helpful, I guess, in uh, writing your job applications. So you can see on this right hand side here, I've got uh, starting at zero, does not meet requirements. And then we've got meets basic requirements, meets requirements with evidence, and then explicitly meets requirements with strong evidence. Going down the left column here, I've focused on formatting and length. The next area is about addressing the selection criteria. And then the next section here is your philosophy statement and projection. And that means like projecting into the role. Now, following on from this rubric, what I've done is I've showed you essentially what it looks like when I write criteria statements. So at the top here, we've got number one, here is where you type the criteria one statement, as in this is the statement that is in the advertisement, which will likely take up two to three lines on this page. I prefer to use a dark color background and white font to help this stand out. The problem when you're on a panel reading a lot of applications is um, it just becomes really monotonous seeing the same thing over and over again. And um, you know, you wanna make sure that your information is easy to read. And I always get good feedback on using this type of formatting. Now this little light blue area here, I use just this color here. And I, this is where I write a short philosophy statement related to the criteria. And then I type, I have for my following points. So for example, I have, led blah 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 and that's where it would be in my bold statement here 
And what I've done here is given you essentially what it looks like when I write a criteria point or a point to address the criteria. So I won't read this whole thing. We're all highly educated people. We know how to read this, but essentially I'm telling you what the bold statement is, what that middle section is. And then in italics here, you'll see as a result, this is my result section. And then you'll see, this is my next point. Now, if you are someone who can write really succinctly and explicitly, you might be able to fit three points here that address that criteria statement. Um, I'm sticking with two and a lot of the applications that I have read have stuck with two. And from my conversations with other people that have sat on panels, that's essentially what most people are using. So then in this second part here, this is where you would write criteria two statement and then continue on in that similar pattern. What I have done is given you some example professional fonts in size 10 and what they look like. Um, you know, we're not using Comic Sans <laughs> for this type of thing. This is a professional document. You want to um, use professional fonts. And then what I've done is I'll let you know that I use Justify in this setting here. So you'll see on the right hand side, it's all nice one line there. Just keeps it neat and tidy and easy to read. Sometimes you'll find that panelists will write in these margins here, little points, things that might um, uh, be points of clarification or conversation, uh, things that you might need to talk about with the other panel if they're not sure what acronyms mean, that sort of a thing. And then down the bottom, I've put a note saying I recommend putting your name the uh, position that you're going for, the school that you're at, um, because when you print these things off, it's good to just have your name on it so they remember, it makes it easier for them to find yours when they're reading through it. Now, going back to this section here, this little rubric that I've got, again, I really wanna reiterate, this is the first time I've made something like this. This is a draft, I, I, I'm very, very sure I'll have feedback on this where I can edit it. I'm just hoping this is helpful. So looking at here, uh, formatting and length, these requirements here are for the New South Wales public education system, the guidelines that we are given. This is for permanent job applications. This is something you have to stick to, to meet requirements. So here where I've got zero does not meet requirements. If you go smaller than size 10, you've breached the guidelines. If your margins are smaller than 2.5 centimeters, you know, excess, if you're, if it's like 2.6, 2.4, no one's sitting there with a ruler. But I mean, if you've stretched it right out to sort of one centimeter, then that gives you an advantage over other people that are applying and it uh, breaches the requirements. If you write more than half a page per criteria and if you don't use a uh, PDF format to submit. So the basic requirements are using size 10 font or slightly larger, you can go larger if you want to. Uh, if you use 2.5 centimeter margins, half a page per criteria and PDF format to submit. Now, obviously that's all you need. You don't have to have anything more than that to be able to meet the re requirements of your size and formatting or formatting and length. But you know, these are the things that I recommend. Use a professional style font of size 10, use the margins, half a page PDF. So you can see there's not much difference there. I'm going to skip down to philosophy statement and projection. This is one of the hardest parts now that we have these limits of half a page. So um, obviously if you don't have them, it, it's not a requirement that you have to have these things. However, these are things that will help present to the panel who you are as a uh, an applicant. So in my mind, I've put as a zero, does not meet requirements, um, you know, does not write to the criteria provided, overshadows points about experience or impact. So for example, if you spend uh, the majority of your half a page section telling me all about your philosophy statement and your theory and your, your understanding and where it comes from as a passion, and then you only spend a little bit of time actually telling me about your experiences, well then, you know, that's, you're not um, addressing the criteria properly and that would be sort of a zero for me. Uh, again, that's, it's, you wouldn't be told, oh, you don't, you haven't followed the, the requirements, but obviously it's not a strong way to present your experiences on the page paper. And then obviously I go across the one, two, three section there where I've said, you know, a high quality one would be a succinctly written philosophy statement or projection with clear link to criteria, enhances the points written about experience or impact while projecting themselves into the role. Now I can tell you now the projection part is one of the parts that I find the hardest as well, especially with our page limits. Now the bigger one here, addressing the selection criteria. So the biggest problem that I see is when um, people are trying to cross between systems. So let's say you're coming from the independent or private sector into the public sector and you aren't aware that you actually have to address the specific criteria in the advertisement. You might just be um, sending over a resume or something else that you've written in the past. So over here I've put zero, does not meet requirements, does not write statements to address the criteria. 
you need to actually write that criteria and specifically address it. So they might be someone who writes statements that are not connected to the criteria. So that could be something like uh, if you specifically asked about, you know, differentiated strategies for literacy and numeracy, and you just kind of talked about how you um, generally, um, you know, teach the English curriculum and the maths curriculum and that you know all of the other subjects or something like that, that's not actually talking about the uh, criteria itself or provides only a resume or a cover page. So literally um, people have applied where they might have given uh, here's my work experience, here's the jobs that I worked at, and here's my references, and that's it, then you're not addressing the criteria. So if you're coming from across systems like that, um, and if it's your first time doing that, um, have a look at some of my other videos as well, that might be helpful for you. And I always offer for um, people to just contact me and I'll have a look at what you've got so far and tell you whether or not that's meeting requirement. Okay, so then we go to meets basic requirements. So when we're, again, this is us talking about the uh, selection criteria, basic requirements, using basic examples to link the criteria without detail or impact. This is essentially the shopping list. This is where people go, um, let's say they've talked about, uh, the criteria might be something about supports or demonstrates support for extracurricular activities in school. And you just go, oh, yep, coached PWSA, taught choir, led the dance group. But you actually haven't talked about how you did that, what happened for the kids, what the benefit was for the kids or the school or the impact of that, the results of that, you know, did it lead to some kind of showcase performance or students getting accepted into some kind of uh, performing arts high school or something like that. Like literally dot point, dot point, dot point, those things like a shopping list. If you're doing that, yeah, you're addressing the criteria, but you're doing it a very poor way. So it, it won't be, um, you know, what you'll see higher on when we go up. Uh, does not provide a clear description of the experience or link the relevance of the examples to the criteria provides too much information about details that are not as relevant. So for example, if, if you were to talk about those extracurricular activities and your details include, I created the attendance lists and I made sure all of the class teachers knew that they were coming out at lunchtime and I made sure a note went home to parents. You know, you, you're not telling me that you gave them an enhanced experience that took them to deeper levels of the creative arts syllabus that you were providing them with opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have had that they were able to collaborate and connect with cultures by um, delving deep into uh, studies around those performing arts or something like that um, and then the impact of that obviously you know insert various impact here with some data uh, uses examples that are basic measures of meeting the criteria and i've got an example there uh, does not include data or tangible evidence to support uh, ev experience in the points and then I go on to say, uses ambiguous statements as impact without evidence. For example, students demonstrated greater levels of engagement or students improved in writing skills. That's good, but that's not clear. It doesn't tell me what kind of improvement in writing or using the learning progressions to give me actual percentages of data of improvement. You could use NAPLAN, you could use check-in assessments, you could use your formative or summative assessments from the classroom to tell me how many students were at expectation at the beginning of the year, and then that greater improvement of how many ex were at expectation at the middle or the end of the year. Give me specific data. Students demonstrated greater levels of engagement. Okay, how do you know that? What's your evidence? What's your proof? How do I know you can transfer that to my school? Or how can you continue that improvement? Okay, so that's like a basic example. Now I'm gonna skip over this middle section because obviously you can read and then I'm just gonna go to this higher level here. So, you know, what, what we're really looking for, explicitly meeting it, uh, it, meeting requirements with strong evidence. So using high quality examples that use explicit and succinct language to directly link to the criteria. This is where people keep going wrong. Keep rereading that criteria, go back and check, go back and check. Um, clear description of experiences that demonstrate good understanding. Again, you can read, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. And then I go down here to list some examples of evidence here that you could use. So for example, these things here, you know, assessment results, consistent or ongoing improvement in an identified area of improvement. You can use your school plan to help you with this. Specific goal achievement, quotes from surveys, quotes from meetings or interviews, quotes from observation reports or PDP reviews. Um, this is your school improvement data, attendance data. If you're applying for a permanent job within your own school, use that school strategic direction. Uh, oh, sorry, here they are right here. Strategic, strategic directions throughout the application, either directly or indirectly, based on experiences and evidence of impact. Okay, so I know that's a bit 
it feels like it's still not quite refined as I would like it to be and maybe it's not as helpful in the way that maybe you want it to say hey here's an example sentence of what I could say and there's a reason I don't do that it's very important I think for you to go through this writing process yourself because there's a lot of things that come out of it it helps you articulate the way that you would like to speak when you get to interview it helps you prepare those ideas in your head when you go to interview to be able to speak really clearly about the things that drive quality education in your classroom and the wonderful things that you do at your school now a lot of people feel like they don't speak confidently at interview and preparing things like this start that process of preparing for you an interview and panelists understand nerves at interview we understand that you know if you you lose your train of thought you get stuck on something there is no judgment on that what we really want is a clear picture of what happens in your classroom and the impact it has on your students and your school. So if you can start to formulate those things on paper, it will help you start to formulate those ideas when you get to interview and just be able to share really explicit evidence of the things that you do. The other thing that I've found through this process too is that as you're writing for these criteria, you'll start to see the gaps in areas of development for yourself. And this is even for people who have been teaching for 30 years, principals who have been doing this for a very long time as well. When they suddenly write to these criteria or look at this criteria, they you know start to reflecting on yourself and you go, well, hang on a second, that's not really an area that I can do very well or that I've focused on. Perhaps it's just been a different pathway for you for whatever reason. And that might help redirect you in some of those areas. This is what helps you cover those those gaps in your own learning and, and helps keeps things fresh for you too so while absolutely i recommend getting someone to look over your application give you feedback and maybe help you reword some things i think it's very important that you do this yourself instead of just going to an agency and saying hey write an application for me that's my personal preference obviously but i know this is hard which is why i'm hoping this document might help you maybe have it out as you're writing and just look at it and go you know what is that really clear and succinct it does this paint a picture does the panel have to read between the lines to understand what I'm saying or is it really clear? Have I got that evidence that, you know, can't be argued with when someone goes, well, how do you know? Like the, the um, you know, um, in higher levels of engagement, students demonstrated higher levels of engagement. How did you know that? You know, if you've got tell them from me survey, you can prove that. You can say, look, my kids said I feel engaged at school. 90% of my kids said I feel comfortable at school or I feel safe at school. That's really good data to have. And if you don't have data like that, that's a good reflection to go, well, how do I know my kids are engaged at school? Is it because I'm seeing higher rates of completion of work? Is it because they're improving in their reading and their writing? And that's the kind of thing that makes you really self-reflect and go, well, how do I actually know my kids are doing insert said thing here? Um, so. I hope this is helpful. I really would love feedback. I would love so much feedback on this. Even if you think this is poorly written, uh, I would love it all because I'd love anything that helps someone start this process. There are a lot of teachers out there who are new to the application writing process that have no idea where to start. I hope this is helpful. So drop a comment below here. Um, this document, sorry, I should be clear about where you can get this document. It is in the description below. So if you're on uh, a mobile phone, uh, sorry, if you're watching this through Facebook or somewhere else, you'll need to open this up in the YouTube app, click on the description box. There's a little drop down box and I'll make this the first link at the top there so that you can just click and open it up into a Google drive, download it for yourself to use. Um, so yeah, comment on this video, comment on Facebook, Twitter, anywhere, uh, or you know what, send me a personal message through the Talk and Chalk Facebook page or on Twitter. If you've got an application you'd like me to have a look at, I'm happy to have a look. I've got a lot that have been sent through to me recently, so I may not be able to do it straight away. Um, but please, any feedback is greatly appreciated, uh, even if you find it useful and you just want to let me know that it's helpful. That would be great. I will wrap it up there for now though. So I will leave my button down here if you haven't subscribed to the channel. If you think this is helpful, thumbs up is always appreciated and I'll leave another random video at the top there for you and I will see you hopefully again soon. Thanks everyone. Bye.